So welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction and Give to Asia with support from the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. So my name is Louis Aguila, learning lead of the Humanitarian Leadership Academy Philippines. To start this webinar, I'll provide an orientation of the platform so you all know how to use it and to interact with us. You should see several buttons on your screen depending on the type of the device you're connecting with. So these buttons will likely be in the top left hand corner of your screen or on the bottom of your screen. So the first button you should see is your audio settings. This is where you can adjust your settings uh, if you're not able to hear me very well or if you want to connect a new piece of hardware such as a pair of headphones. So next to this is the chat button which is the function that you can use to introduce yourself to the panelists. You can tell us your name and your organization and perhaps if you'd also like to share a little bit about your experiences on this topic and what you hope to learn today, for example. Next to that button is the raise hand button, which we won't be using today. So if you have any questions, please just feel free to post them straight away to the Q&A without feeling the need to raise your hand first. And lastly, we have the Q&A button. So this is the main functionality that you will be using to interact with us in this webinar. Please post any questions that you have. Feel free to do so throughout the webinar's presentations and discussions. So my colleagues and I will be online and responding to all those that we can as they come through in writing. And we'll also post the, the, the other questions directly to our panel of speakers during the dedicated Q&A session, which will be held towards the end of the webinar. Please note that if we do run out of time and, we, and if we aren't able to answer any of your questions, we will do so after the webinar alongside a recorded version of this webinar, which you can re-watch or share with your colleagues or within your networks for those who couldn't make it today. So that's about it for the platform introduction. I'll hand over the floor to Wilson Barbon of IRR. Good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, third uh, webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of the series of webinars we are organizing for uh, as part of our program called the, the Non-Government Organization Disaster Preparedness Program. Uh, it's a partnership project between uh, IRRR and give to asia which seeks to build the uh, capacities of a network of community-based organizations in uh, seven to eight countries in uh, Asia. And, uh, and uh, this webinar is part of that uh, providing capacity development assistance to, to these uh, CBOs. Now, one of the, the key themes that uh, surfaced during our initial discussions with uh, this uh, network of CBOs in Asia is the topic of resource mobilization, fundraising, and sustainability. But unfortunately, it is one of the key uh, challenges in working with CBOs in Southeast Asia is the, the level of investment going into uh, CBOs are not that, uh, you know, is not that great. And uh, this has resulted to, you know, challenges in terms of how do these CBOs sustain themselves in, uh, you know, continuing their uh, good work on disaster preparedness in their respective communities. And uh, we all know, we all value the, the huge potential and role of uh, community-based organizations in not only in uh, disaster response, you know, like organizing uh, re disaster relief and recovery, but more so in facilitating community-based disaster preparedness uh, you know, initiatives at the community level. Uh, they, they, they make do with less uh, resources. They are always in the front line working with local people. So it, it is this uh, value of community-based organizations that uh, makes them you know, uh, good where we should be putting more investments. So for this webinar, we'll be talking about what are some of the, you know, good practices, challenges. So we will deep dive into this discussion about fundraising and how CBOs engage with their donors, with their partners uh, and, and, and organizations, you know, to, to make, uh, make use efficiently uh, limited resources for uh, disaster preparedness programs. For the objectives of this webinar, we'll be looking at current and global trends in terms of challenges and how do we mobilize investments. Uh, we will learn 
a little about modalities and avenues to generate and mobilize resources for community disaster preparedness programs. It's not always, you know, writing proposals and getting money from donors, but we will look at different uh, ways that we can mobilize resources for our disaster preparedness programs. And then finally, we will look at listen at our speakers more of uh, sharing effective strategies and practices in terms of strengthening our engagement with current and potential donors for disaster preparedness uh, programs. So for this webinar, we have two resource speakers. So the first one is Dr. John R. Button. So he is our senior advisor here for international outreach at the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction here in Silang, uh, Philippines. So John has uh, more than 30 years experience working in, uh, in Africa. And uh, he just recently returned to the Philippines, uh, where he's currently working as our senior advisor for international outreach. So John started his career in development work with IRRR uh, many years back, and this is like his homecoming to the Institute. So John will share to us his uh, vast experience and exposure in terms of capacity development, uh, funding, and, uh, and, and working with international organizations. Our second resource speaker is uh, Mr. Birgir uh, Stamperdal. So he is the CEO and uh, president of Give to Asia, our partner organization. So uh, Birgir has been a part of Give to Asia team for quite a number of years now, and uh, he has a, a, an experience, extensive experience in working with nonprofit as well as for-profit organizations, uh, you know, mobilizing resources, providing technical assistance, and uh, serving uh, donors and clients, as well as uh, you know, different community-based organizations here in Asia. So our first speaker, uh, Jan Batten, you know, he, he, his career has always been with people-centered development. Uh, he is the former CEO of ActionAid, uh, based in London. Uh, he served as Director General for AMREF, that's the African Medical Research Foundation in Kenya and has served as like a consultant for, you know, for many organizations, including the Poverty Eradication Network and several CSOs in Africa and Asia. So, John, based on your experience, you know, how, 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 how important are CBO this, you know, overall conversation about fundraising? And, 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 and why is that, that uh, you know, when we talk about generating and investments in community preparedness programs. Why is it important for CBOs to be part of that? And, you know, and maybe you can share about what are your experiences and insight into this topic of CBOs and fundraising? Jan? Uh, thank you very much, Wilson, for that uh, introduction. And uh, good day to you all on this uh, uh, webinar. This is my uh, Pleasure to join a second webinar with the uh, collaborative project between Give to Asia and IIRR. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to have an opportunity to share with you some of my experience. Uh, it's interesting that we should be talking today about uh, fundraising for DPP when uh, the news in the Philippines is the terrible tragedy going on in Japan at the moment where uh, the country is uh, inundated with terrible floods and our thoughts and prayers go out to the people who are suffering there. It makes you reflect even more on some of the countries in Southeast Asia uh, where you're all working and uh, whether in fact we're as prepared as Japan and uh, we know we're not. And if we were to be suffering the same level of rains, I, th I think we were... Uh, it really serves to motivate us all to uh, try harder and work faster to enable more vulnerable communities to be prepared. So today, uh, fundraising. Um, we do a lot of capacity building for CBOs, but quite often fundraising is an area that we, we ignore at our peril. Because uh, sooner or later, every CBO wishes to be able to sustain itself. And uh, no matter how you were funded, uh, whether you had a benefactor or whether you evolved slowly, um, unless you happen to have a lifetime benefactor, uh, which few of us have, sooner or later you're going to need to engage in fundraising. 
And for many, uh, this is a great challenge. Um, CBOs, when they start in life, are often people rich uh, and cash poor. Mm. By that I mean that a lot of energy and commitment by dedicated people go into starting CBOs. Uh, and quite often the concern is the core business that you have, your disaster preparedness or um, DRR or development initiatives more broadly. Uh, and quite often we are not experts in raising funds and income for our organizations. So for many CBOs, I think this is an area of, um, of threat and potential weakness to our long-term uh, survival. Um, of course, when we, are, when we go to donors, they're looking for CBOs that are strong and that can sustain themselves. Um, and sustainability is something that we should best plan for from the very outset of uh, starting our organizations, not to begin uh, stressing about fundraising when we're already uh, financially challenged. So financial sustainability, what exactly is that? Well, it requires, I would suggest, um, diversified sources of income. Um, if you rely obviously on a single donor, that's a, that's a very um, risky uh, proposition. And I would argue that if, if you rely even on one type of donor source, that's also um, risky because families of donors tend to um, be strong and uh, weak at the same time. Uh, and if you are invested in one family of donors, um, quite often what, what one does or what one is able to do is um, replicated with others in that same family of donors. So diversified sources of income. Uh, the second thing I would suggest in financial sustainability is having an established funding reserve. Again, few CBOs have, um, have bank accounts with money sitting in it unused. Uh, but to have and to work at establishing a reserve over time is really quite important when you have gaps in income flows, which uh, many of us experience um, on a fairly regular basis. Um, the third uh, aspect of financial sustainability, I think, is organizational strength itself. And I'll return to that um, a little bit later. Um, now, why CBOs uh, in the field of disaster preparedness? Why are they preferred partners? And why is there now so much um, concern that we enable CBOs to become stronger and more sustainable? Well, of course, as we all witness, the frequency and seriousness of disasters seems to be increasing um, with climate change and uh, uh, increasing uh, droughts, increasing floods, increasing storms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This seems to be almost a global uh, phenomenon, but of course, it's the vulnerable communities that suffer the most. Um, although, as we can see, even those com 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 communities that have already established a high level of preparedness are still vulnerable. So it's all a matter of degree. Uh, so it's the poorest communities that need to strengthen their preparedness the most. Um, and uh, sustainable uh, local CBOs are the most effective agents in ensuring that communities are most prepared and continue to work on their preparedness on an ongoing basis. Um, CBOs themselves are more cost effective and more efficient than uh, other types of organizations, particularly those not based in the community. Uh, CBOs have local knowledge, of course, uh, and normally they have the trust of local people. Certainly if they are surviving and sustainable, they have the trust of local people. Uh, CBOs can mobilize immediately. Uh, they are part of the community. They can also become integral parts of the local government infrastructure uh, and recognized as assets at the community level. Um, both for um, participating in uh, disaster preparedness and response, but also in sharing local government resources that uh, are quite often a donor to local CBOs uh, and not to other kinds of organizations. CBOs, um, before they really enter into fundraising seriously, 
need to reflect on, I think, themselves and how strong they are as an organization, how well they are managed, and particularly how well they manage their funds. However good your fundraising marketing may be, if the organization you're generating income for uh, is perceived to be weak um, or perceived to be um, inefficient at managing funds, no matter how good your marketing is, you're unlikely to have a very positive result. So CBO management is really quite a critical aspect and its leadership. Um, community members desire their CBOs, of course, to be successful, to be able to sustain themselves and to grow. And it's in everyone's interest that this actually happens. So CBOs must demonstrate their ability to manage themselves well and safeguard the resources and oversee the resources that they have entrusted to them. The, um, yes, and I think this, of course, um, for all the hard work many organizations do in building up their reputations and their strength uh, and their uh, transparency, um, years of hard work can be wasted overnight when there's misuse of resources and uh, corruption, which has bedeviled, of course, so many organizations. Uh, although I should say that this is less true, I think, of CBOs because they are so much in the limelight with their community members. Um, it's very, you're very accountable when you're right on the spot with the people that you are both helping and uh, raising funds for. The next slide, please. So before you begin um, fundraising seriously, what then are some of the factors that you need to consider in, term, in terms of organizational readiness? Um, uh, the first, of course, is um, your organization should be conducting activities, which I've called here fit for purpose. Um, what does that mean? Well, people are going to give money for, to organizations that are actually addressing real needs or real priorities or real issues in the community. There are organizations who work in areas of development which are really quite uh, difficult to raise money for. They're not as popular as others. I think if you're focusing on disaster preparedness, that's a very immediate um, and, and uh, important issue for, um, for communities. So it should stand to reason uh, that what you're doing is appreciated by the community and therefore likely to your fundraising is more likely to succeed. I would also say that a part of organizational readiness is to be able to demonstrate that you have the capacity to survive as an organization. People will be reticent to invest resources in an organization that may be not around next month or next quarter or next year. So organizational strength in terms of your your board or your governance or your management or your, your continuity of staff, um, having systems in place which you use. Uh, these, are, these are all a part of demonstrating to the public at large and potential donors that you have the capacity to survive. Having a strong set of values and principles that are where you stick to, having credible leadership, um, having had a, a successful um, a number of projects at the community level implemented, uh, benefiting the community. These are all a part of building your credibility uh, for when you try to raise funds uh, at a local level and even, um, even beyond the community itself. As we've mentioned, funds need to be well managed. You need to be open and transparent. Um, and I think, that, uh, I think that goes without saying. Um, moving on. Uh, so fundraising itself then, where, where do CBOs actually generate their resources from? Uh, I talked earlier about the importance of diversifying your income sources if you're going to be sustainable. Well, here are five areas um, that I've summarized of different families of donors, if you like, or families of income that you generate um, and these are true for the large multinational NGO as they are for the local CBO. 
But of course, within each of these categories, you would be addressing uh, and targeting different potential donors. The first and biggest source of income for local CBOs are individuals. Um, not necessarily high net worth individuals. Um, CBOs raise money from middle, middle income people and even from people in the community themselves with a relatively low level of income. Uh, community participation, both in terms of local gifts and uh, giving time and wisdom to projects, lowers the cost of projects, um, and quite often poor people themselves can, can give even a modest amount to local causes. The extent to which they do that, of course, helps in raising money from people outside the community with a middle income or even high net worth individuals. Self-generated income is the next group of uh, income. Many local CBOs have projects through which they can um, generate income and uh, maybe technical capacity and personnel who can also generate income from services they provide to others. This type of income is very critical because it is unearmarked money. It's money which is, it can be used for a wide number of purposes. Then you have the corporate and business sector, local businesses, um, local corporations who often want to promote their community um, uh, engagement and their social enterprise by uh, providing gifts in kind or, or funding to, to local CBOs. Then of course, perhaps further away from communities, but often very interested in helping CBOs are a wide range of institutions international NGOs, faith-based organizations, foundations, trusts, and research partners, academic institutions that like to work with communities at a local level. All of these are open to receive um, proposals for partnership at the local level um, uh, in return for achieving their own uh, goals and objectives. And finally, we've got the official donors, uh, all too often, we tend to talk about donors as though they are uh, official donors, that is bilateral and multilateral donors. Uh, here in Asia, of course, we have many generous uh, official donors uh, from Japan, China, Australia, Korea. USAID, of course, has long been a big donor to some of the countries in Southeast Asia. The EU, particularly some Northern European countries, uh, and of course the various UN agencies. Uh, these donors of course are um, quite demanding uh, professionally in terms of how you succeed in generating income from them. The rewards can be high, but quite often you have to raise your organizational capacity significantly uh, to qualify for those. So just finishing I think with some key lessons learned uh, from uh, my experience with uh, CBOs. Uh, I think to be successful, you need to live within your means. Uh, that is, be very careful that when you do have a time of uh, sufficient sources of funding, that you don't uh, live to the full extent of, the, of what that funding allows. Um, there have been many cases where CBOs or local NGOs uh, gear up for high levels of funding, which they then can't sustain from local sources in the long term. So do be careful uh, as you, uh, as you switch, change your culture and gear up your capacity that you don't get to a level where you can't uh, sustain that level of funding over the long term. Organizational capacity is something that every organization from day one needs to continually invest in. Um, the stronger your organization becomes, the stronger your programs become, the stronger your staff become and the better positioned you are to uh, successfully generate more funds. And the last slide, please. Um, networking, of course, is critical. Building up your networks of contacts and friends, um, which you can call on in the longer term after current funding uh, is, is over. Uh, networking is a continual issue. Uh, keep a good database, make sure it's current, uh, interact with your networks. It's become much easier in this day and age with the internet. And most importantly, never forget your core donors, your original donors or the donors that have supported you over a long period of time. The most important donors you have are the ones you currently have. 
do make sure you communicate with them well, that you treat them well, that you meet their expectations. These are the ones who've been supporting you from, for, from the beginning and you need to build on them, not find yourself going to new donors and then finding your old ones uh, dropping out. So I think uh, that's all I have time for. Uh, lots of red flags are flashing here. Uh, so um, I'll hand back to uh, uh, Wilson and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Yep. yep, thank you. Thank you so much, John, for those uh, like valuable insights into this topic. And, uh, and I think in your own view, you, you, know, you, 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 talk about, you talk about fundraising as not much about the availability of resources and about donors. You, know, you talk more about, it's more about strengthening capacities of CBOs to demonstrate effective work, good leadership, and transparent and a more accountable management. Because as you mentioned, you know, donors would not fund CBOs that, you know, they're not sure whether they will continue to exist you know, six months down the line or, you know, one year down. So it's very important, I think, uh, of my key takeaway in, in your points are that, you know, for CBOs to be really effective in fundraising is, you know, it needs to be very proactive, you know, and very strategic in terms of including their fundraising goals uh, into their long-term planning and operations. And, uh, and, and I think that's a, a different way of discussing this topic where we usually, you know, discuss fundraising as just the role of, donors and how much money is available but cbos needs a lot of you know some housekeeping uh, tasks needs to be done you know for for us to be fund fundable and uh, you also mentioned about the emerging trends in terms of the increasing role of individuals and corporate donors and local and international and our next next speaker from our partner give to asia i think is is the is the person who who will share you know, insight, more insights into this topic. Speaker is uh, Berger, Berger Stamperdal. He's the president and CEO. Uh, you know, good morning, Berger. And uh, you know, Berger has worked with uh, a, lot, a number of tech companies in the Silicon Valley, you know, Valley. marketing and programs. And so he has both experience in terms of profit and non-profit business management and marketing. And uh, he has been uh, in leadership with give to asia for a number of years now assisting local nonprofits, strengthening donor relations. And, uh, and I think a burger into this webinar is, uh, is valuable in providing insight in terms of, because Give to Asia is mostly engaged in donors in the US. So burger in your view, what are some of the trends now with regards to say disaster preparedness funding in, in, in the US? And how do you think CBO should you know, respond to these trends and to these opportunities that are you know, uh, emerging in the US? Berger? Sure, thank you, Wilson. Uh, very happy to be here today. And uh, it's very, uh, uh, it's good to see so many people on the, the webinar. And uh, this has been a great partnership between GiveTasia and IIRR. Maybe what I should do is start quickly by describing a little bit about what Give to Asia does um, so that um, just to give some context of the feedback I'm going to give a little bit later on. Um, so we're a little bit different as an organization. We are a really a philanthropic service organization in a way. We've been doing this work for about 17 years, um, working with corporations, individuals, and families, and some private foundations um, during uh, during their efforts to support local communities in the Asia Pacific region. So we've, we're working right now in 25 different countries across the region, and we're fundraising primarily in the United States and Hong Kong, although we also uh, have some donors in other parts of the world. Um, so that's a big part of what we do is working with those donors to help build the relationships with them and community-based organizations and other in-country or organizations in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, one of the big uh, uh, parts of what we do is that we have local people in all of the locations where we, where we work. We think that's a really important part of the, the work that we do because we're able to work in the local language and have more of a face-to-face -face relationship with organizations like yours, um, uh, and work with you, not just 
in trying to make the connections with donors, but also through the grant process. And, and let me talk a little bit about the way we work with donors in particular. Um, so the, the, the way that we work with donors is we identify what they're looking to fund, and we try to find a match with organizations in the, in the countries and in the communities that they care about. And some of that work is done via research that, that we carry out. Um, and then once that happens, we act as a sort of steward and project manager for the projects that are being funded by those donors, those, those corporations or by those families or by those individuals. Um, and we also do quite a bit of work with corporations in supporting their CSR teams that are oftentimes based in country and are local to you and doing things like volunteering or donating their own money that is then being matched by the company. Um, we also do quite a bit of work directly with Asia-based nonprofits. Um, so as some of you may, th may think of us as a grant making organization um, and funding specific projects. Um, we also have fiscal sponsorship uh, relationships with about uh, 275 organizations in the Asia Pacific region um, that use our registration in the US and Hong Kong to uh, fundraise and to be able to give their supporters in those countries a tax deduction for their support to you in, in your communities. Um, we also try to provide greater visibility for those organizations that are part of our network and opportunistically market and try to sell specific projects that our uh, CBO and grantee partners come to us with. Um, and again, all of this is done in, with, uh, in language and we are able to also provide some capacity building in language um, and uh, program support for specific donor projects. So in, with, with uh, this particular project and, and the partnership that we have with IIRR, um, we've been partnered uh, with IIRR since 2014 to help build what we call a community of practice of locally led disaster preparedness programs and CBOs that are doing, doing that work. Um, one of our roles has been, a way, has been to try to find effective ways to tap more international philanthropy for CBOs engaged in disaster preparedness. And again, the primary targets for that are corporations, families and individuals, and some larger private foundations. So let me share with you some of the takeaways that we've had over the last four years and what we've learned about trying to go after that kind of donor, uh, or those kinds of gifts for uh, CBO disaster preparedness programs. One of the, I'm gonna do this by uh, donor type because the donors are very different depending on, on who they are and sort of where they sit and what their priorities are. So for corporations, uh, typically we've found that they don't identify themselves as disaster preparedness donors. It's not a theme that many corporations, at least not in our network, have, um, have identified as a primary target. They're far more driven to actually give in the aftermath of disaster, which is a little frustrating which, because it means that the, the funding cycles are very uneven. There's a lot of giving that happens right after a disaster some of that giving does go to disaster preparedness, but there isn't a consistent stream. Um, what we found instead is that there are a lot of uh, corporate donors who are giving to themes that might fall more in line with resilience programs. So livelihood diversification, infrastructure, health services, and other kinds of activities that might be part of an overall resilience program, and in some cases, disaster preparedness. The, the actual dollar amount that families and individuals give is much larger than corporations. And so, um, so while oftentimes that might mean uh, building more strong personal relationships with larger individual donors, um, you can also crowdfund uh, and tap philanthropy from individuals and families in different ways. And finally, private foundations, um, a handful we found are very focused right now on um, on, on trying to fund at the local level. Um, many of the larger foundations um, tend to work with larger INGOs to do that kind of work, but they are looking at ways to shift the model that they consider to be more of a top-down funding model traditionally, and looking for ways to give more of the decision-making power to uh, local leadership. So how do you engage uh, with 
uh, with these, these three different kinds of donors. Um, so I'll provide some advice that hopefully is helpful as you're thinking about ways that your organization might tap into those kinds of donor sources. Um, for corporations, I would say, think about who is, is in your country, who may even be in your community, um, and tr how can you get in front of their employees, the you know, local employees of large, larger international companies, as well as companies that are domestic to you, have a great deal of influence, probably more influence than you realize in um, helping to identify local CSR and philanthropy partners. Um, the other piece is to really understand what the company funds um, so that you understand how your programs might fit in. You're gonna have much more success in your initial conversation with a company or with employees if you know already what their, the alignment of your programs are with what that company funds. And then make yourself visible. Um, in your country, there are events that bring together companies for their CSR and philanthropy programs. Look and see how you can build visibility um, near you with some of the companies near you. Um, and post-disaster, again, is unfortunately the best time to make an ask. Um, uh, families. Um, I would say that families are, are often word of mouth. Um, do you, you know, if you have already individual donors who you're working with, um, try to find out how they can be an ambassador to you and spread the word. Um, if they care enough to give to you, they can also perhaps be tapped to um, bring in more donors um, to support your programs. Um, fiscal sponsorship, as I mentioned before, which Give to Asia does, can help provide some visibility to you outside of your geographic area. Um, and then getting people to visit you and, and see your work is probably one of the best ways to build really loyal, uh, loyal donors. Um, and then I guess the final piece I'd say with families, but I, perhaps with all donors, is to be with, as transparent as possible. Trust, we find, is one of the major barriers for someone to give a gift. Uh, and so understanding that, um, that in order to build trust, you have to be transparent um, and, and responsive to the kinds of questions that donors ask, um, it's going to help you be successful. Um, more, you know, more quickly, more often. And then finally, um, with the private foundations, uh, again, I, as I mentioned before, we find that the larger international foundations typically seek, uh, seek uh, international NGO partners to work even at the local level. Um, and so you may want to identify an INGO who you can partner with, who understands you, understands what your priorities are, understands how, how you work and, and how, how you could be best served, and they might be able to also get you in front of some of those larger private foundations. Uh, just a couple of more slides here on, um, uh, on engaging. So I, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about engaging online. Um, this, is, this may seem obvious, um, but in our experience, uh, we've worked with many uh, local nonprofit organizations in various countries um, that are um, maybe not doing some of the basics to help build visibility for themselves. Do you have a website? Um, and can people make online donations on that site? Is there a simple message um, that is a clear call to action? Um, sometimes what we see on, on, on websites is a lot of information showing lots of different things going on. Um, and sometimes it's hard for the donor to understand what the organization's really doing. So as much as you can simplify and really hit home the core of what your organization does and why somebody should give online, I think the more you're gonna convert some of those visitors to your site into donors. Social media can help. We find that we're primarily working on Facebook and Twitter, quite frankly. Um, we find that Facebook is very good for building followers and we are seeing an increasing number of donors coming from that platform. Um, and um, we also see that the more serious, larger donors are seeking advice and trends and seeing what's happening on Twitter where some other conversations are happening. Um, regardless of what you're doing with your marketing, images tell stories and attract far more attention on social media and videos um, even more. If you have the ability to tell stories with images and tell stories with videos uh, for, your, for your social media, um, it's going to reap um, bigger returns. Um, 
But in the end, it's about getting the introduction to the donor who may give a significant amount. Um, and so ma most major donors will want a direct in-person connection or at least a phone discussion before committing funds. So um, be prepared that you'll, you'll need to have that relationship with, with, with donors um, and, and make them in a way partners for you. Um, our advice for community-led programs um, is that um, you first, before you do anything else, should engage with your community to understand what, the, what your own needs are and don't lose sight of your own community while you go after the dollars. Um, we've seen in the past that um, some organizations um, do what the larger donors will want them to do as opposed to really focusing on what the community needs. Um, but what we found is that donors actually want um, more and more the community-based organizations to be experts um, that understand um, what's really needed in their community and it's okay, uh, it's okay to have an opinion on what really is needed and what should be funded. And again, be transparent and network, and build those relationships. Um, I'm gonna um, quickly touch on general donor engagement advice, uh, understand what motivates them. Again, as I mentioned with corporations, understand what they give to but also understand what information they want and, um, and how to steward them so that they will come back again and again. Um, keep regular and open communication with your supporters. As uh, uh, Dr. Batten said, uh, stewarding your existing donors and building trust there is probably the most important thing you can do. Um, personalize your communication, take time to personally thank and inform each donor and share stories of impact, but also share impact numbers. Um, and then my last slide is just some general advice for launching a campaign. Um, a strong cause or a program um, that responds to community need and is described really clearly and has a clear call to action um, uh, is, a great, is a great campaign, especially if it can, can, can scale and um, can take various sizes of donations. Um, that still give each donor a sense that they are contributing a meaningful piece to the program. Um, we, we do run some, pro, some partnership uh, campaigns uh, where somebody who makes a um, $100 gift, for example, is giving a very clear segment uh, and definable segment of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the project, whether it be supporting education for one person or um, funding a, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a one, one week of school um, and uh, set a specific amount when you make the ask um, rather than keeping it general. Uh, hopefully some of those pieces of advice have been helpful. Um, I'm looking forward to answering questions during the Q&A. I'm sure there's probably much more to say, but I'll stop there. Uh, thank you again. Okay, thank, thank you, Berger, for, you know, do you have a, uh, for those very practical suggestions and tips about engaging donors and providing us some, uh, uh, some perspective in terms of the U.S.-based uh, sources of funding for disaster preparedness. And I think you've, uh, you've shared a key, you know, some important points on practical things of what CBOs can, can do. So one really important is about visibility. I think that is something uh, that you know CBOs can can also uh, you know make within their organization, like online and doing some social media work. Uh, more visibility in terms of and videos, attending local events because not all donors are just looking at outside their country, but within their country are the opportunities as well for, for corporate and, fam and individual donors. And you also mentioned about the importance of winning and sustaining trust with donors. And I think that will be sustained with more uh, engagement with them, with our donors. You know, CBOs need to engage with donors more effectively, more regularly to build and strengthen that trust. And finally, in your uh, you know, last slides about CBOs, I think uh, just like similar to what Dr. Batten mentioned that you know, the, the, the huge fundraising uh, asset for a CBO is their quality of their work in their communities. Their sustained engagement with the people that they are serving. Unless that is like clear, sustained, and communicated very well, 
uh, you know, C CBOs will not be able to uh, strides in terms of securing funding to sustain their programs. So thank you again, Dr. Batten, for sharing your insights and Berger also. So now it's a time for our uh, question and answer. So actually, I have two uh, questions. So now, uh, now there are three three questions uh, being raised. So I will start with question number one. It was uh, raised earlier. I think during the time when uh, Dr. Batten was uh, discussing, this is about a uh, country like us. If we talk about fundraising, uh, there should be an NGO. You know? like th there, is a, uh, there is a huge role for NG INGOs, international NGOs, to come between the donor and the CBO. So what are your thoughts about, you know, how can we change this trend from CBOs directly accessing funding uh, to a donor? I mean, what are some of the tips, your insight, you know, this huge uh, role that INGOs plays in making that connection? Uh, maybe John or Berger can respond to that question. Um, okay, John? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think um, the observation that um, my observation really is that for CBOs and small local NGOs, um, I would say it's true. It's much more difficult to access the larger intergovernmental, bilateral, multilateral donors. Um, it's difficult because sometimes the size of the projects. Um, that you're looking at um, are rather small for the amount of investment you need to make in establishing uh, a proposal uh, and a relationship with a large bilateral donor or multilateral donor, uh, which is why the practice, if you're focusing on official donors, the practice is really to go through some intermediary institution and the international NGOs then tend to be the one of choice. Um, they are easier to build a relationship with. Uh, they are able to work at smaller levels. Uh, they have staff that are closer to the community. Uh, so they do make a good, um, uh, good go-between. Um, but I think um, for disaster preparedness work, and I saw another question that um, implied also that even if you're in touch with such large bilateral donors, um, disaster preparedness tends not to be a priority focus of many of them. They tend to be looking um, either in other sectors or subsectors or more broadly at the long-term uh, development process. So I think what was implicit in some of my remarks earlier is that I would urge smaller local organizations to really look at the resource base you've got um, closer to home, uh, to look at other, kind, other kinds of donors that would appreciate the importance of building capacity in disaster preparedness. Um, uh, one I think that um, we've not discussed much is the local government. Now, I know in some countries that might not be a very helpful suggestion because the relationship may not be good between local government and CBOs. But I think in other countries, um, disaster preparedness is getting a lot of attention from government and funds from central to local government are being allocated and they are available for access to local community efforts. So I think in those countries where the relationships between the nonprofit sector and local governance is, is stronger, um, we should not leave them out of the, equ uh, out of the uh, equation. Um, so I think uh, my, my advice is, um, is to look at local corporations, to look at local individual fundraising, um, to, to see whether there aren't areas where you can generate your own income, to avoid this um, uh, dependence, if you like, on going to the bigger aid agencies and therefore going through um, intermediaries um, who themselves are actually struggling to... Uh, uh, to, to maintain their, their own uh, funding diversification. So um, I think uh, as your work is local, you know, think local with fundraising and move outward from success locally to, 
to success with donors who are further afield. I hope that's uh, helpful. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, just breathing through the questions that are uh, being raised. So you, so I, th I think the questions about uh, the role of INGOs and the role of intermediaries in terms of fun of generating resources for CBOs. And then one question is being raised here is about, you know, is is what sort of maybe Burger can provide some insight into this discussion? Like, is there like a current advocacy? You know, at the level of among donors, whether you know there is a move to changing this reality of you know of of creating more more mechanisms that make funding more accessible for uh, CBOs and not just for uh, INGOs. So, Virgil, sure. yeah, yeah. So what I I mentioned earlier in my uh, presentation the. Um, that there is a trend with some private foundations looking at how can we shift the model um, to um, be more um, uh, focused on and looking at what is what's happening at the local level um, and allowing CBOs and local nonprofits to play more of a decision-making role uh, in 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 the the way funding comes from international sources. Um, I think there is a um, there is a, a, a I think a a, a swing towards um, um, funding at funding local locally driven programs right now, um, and that those conversations are happening with some of the larger private foundations. Um, there was also um, a draw. Uh, a, I think the United Nations, and I'm forgetting the name of the of the um, of the um, you know of the decision, but there was an attempt to. Um, there currently, only about one percent of international funding goes to local local organizations, and they're trying to shift that so that twenty percent from various donor sources um, will go to local organizations. That's a huge, um, ag aggressive um, stance to take, um, and it's causing the private philanthropy community to look and see what how it can contribute. Going back to the earlier question that Dr. Batten answered, I would say that one of the challenges with reaching that goal with private philanthropy is not just um, CBO's difficulty in reaching donors, but also the donor's difficulty in reaching the local organizations, knowing who to trust, um, um, being able to get a tax deduction, which for many donors in the US is a huge motivation. Um, there's, in many of those situations, um, they they are looking for a partner, um, perhaps uh, an international NGO or a U.S. based organization that helps them find those local organizations that they want to fund. Um, I think maybe the more important part of that equation is the CBO's ability to then build a direct relationship with the donor, regardless of how the funds flow, um, because that's really the relationship you want to have is with the donor, not with the intermediary. Yep, exactly. thank you. Yep, thank you, uh, Berger. I think you mentioned about uh, earlier, you know, in the previous conversation, we had about this great bargain that uh, they referred to shifting the priorities of create from 1% to 20%, but a huge, that's a huge ask, that's a huge target, you know, based on the current pace of change in terms of uh, making funds available for CBOs. But you know, but it's an ongoing discussion, which is a, a good thing. It's a conversation that is happening that was not happening, you know, four years ago when we were starting this NGO disaster fairness program. Yeah. So next question, uh, I think there's another question here that would uh, has been already responded to by uh, your responses from Dr. Batten. It's about entry point. How do we? gain access to this uh, funding and unfortunately right now it's all it's through networks and through our contacts in INGOs and and uh, whoever our partners in these uh, donor countries uh, so we look at it yeah, we look at a different question now uh, there's a another question about that like, what's the current feel for donor funding in terms of disaster preparedness uh, Berger mentioned earlier that most of the funding goes to reactive humanitarian response 
but not so much on preparedness activities. Uh, is there like, you know, what are some of the opportunities that, you know, you can think of that we can, while this is happening, we can still include disaster preparedness uh, initiatives within those current funding streams on disaster response. So, yep. Yep. I do think that there are family and individual and private philanthropy, five private foundations that are focused on the area of disaster preparedness. I just, I think it, it's a harder um, sell to corporations, um, but there are donors who are looking at disaster preparedness in the context of climate change um, or in the context of um, uh, the specific area, country areas that they're interested in. And also, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that there are donors who will fund disaster preparedness in the context of a larger uh, community resilience program. Uh, if they have an interest in the community for whatever reason, they have a vested interest in supporting preparedness. Um, but I do think that from our perspective, corporations have been the hardest nut to crack. And I would like to go back also to something Dr. Batten said, which I think is a really key point, is that um, really, I think for uh, for some of these um, uh, some some of some of these programs looking domestically as opposed to internationally for your funding sources is going to be the best long term the best long term play um, because uh, the the donors local to you are going to be the most committed uh, maybe <laughs> so uh yeah i think uh, we still have like a number of questions uh, being raised by our participants but uh, unfortunately we we are running out of uh, time so we need to wrap this up but uh, as uh, I, I assure all the participants that we will respond to all these questions either through mail and it will be recorded into this uh, webinar uh you know discussion that we will upload in our community of practice uh, website so just to wrap up like what we have discussed and uh, learned you know in terms of uh in terms of our objectives in terms of what are the trends so one of the trends uh, we are now looking at different donor sources not just from big uh, you know bilateral and institutional donors and grants but we're now looking at the role of individual donors you know, individual giving and philanthropies in terms of modalities, we have now graduated from just uh, writing proposals and accessing grants. Now we have opportunities online for crowdfunding, you know, reaching and tapping most of this individual giving and mobilizing volunteers uh, to support our disaster preparedness programs. And then in terms of our practical way forward, like after this webinar, what can the CBOs do? you know for to improve and in, in, in strengthen fundraising first is about thinking seriously about long long-term sustainability of the cbos think about fundraising as an element for your organizational health and then secondly think about visibility like how can the cbos will be more visible online you know, attending meetings and events locally that would help the visibilities for our cbos and then finally, we need, uh, we need to set up some mechanisms and practices within CBOs of sustaining our engagement with our current donors in straight, strengthening that relationships, uh, you know, maintaining that trust by giving them updates and communication regularly. Uh, and uh, yep, so those are the key takeaways that we are, you know, we have thought, talked about in this webinar. So I would like to invite you also to continue our conversation. We have a, a discussion forum in our website, in our community of practice website. The link is uh, flash on your screen. And then we also have, uh, uh, for if you want more courses on fundraising, you can also visit the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, the online learning platform. Uh, the link is there, kayaconnect.org. They provide a number of online courses uh, for CBOs, you know, on this topic on fundraising. And then the webinar, once we have uh, made it available, we will upload this in our Committee of Practice website, www.dppasia.net. So you will find the recording of this webinar and even the previous uh, webinars that we have conducted in the past. So on that note, thank you very much, uh, Berger and uh, John, for 
uh, may taking time to meet us and uh, burger i know it's late there in your side of the world but you know thank you for taking us for taking time to talk to uh, us here in asia and uh, until the next webinar so thank you irrr give to asia hla for you know for facilitating this uh, webinar thank you bye bye thank you